afternoon, everyone. It falls to me to welcome you to our Sabbath service. I'd firstly like to welcome all those who uh, have joined our live, screen, live stream and who are viewing us on our YouTube channel. We welcome you and we um, hope that you will like and subscribe and continue to um, visit us on a Sabbath morning. You're also uh, welcome to um, view our website and to communicate with our communi communications uh, team via the chat function. Uh, to our regular members on Zoom, welcome, happy Sabbath, and nice to see you once again. And I pray that we will be blessed by today's communion service. Uh, and we thank the Lord for all his blessings. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, humbly, humbly we bow in your presence on the Sabbath day. Father, we bow and we assemble to worship you. We assemble to worship you, to praise you, and to adore you because we recognize you as the potentate of all time, the ruler, the creator, the one who spoke worlds into existence. Lord, we recognize you as the one who sustains all life in the palm of your hand, the one who who owns us, Lord, through creation once and twice through salvation. Mm. And Lord, we just want to say to you this morning, this afternoon, thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for, thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us with an everlasting love. A love, Lord, that surely will take eternity for us to really, truly, truly understand. And Lord, on this most solemn, solemn of occasions where we would assemble to walk in your footsteps, Christ, to break bread and to sup juice, wine together. Father, we ask for your, for your cleansing and for your forgiveness. Lord, we are so grateful that when you saw the condition of man, you did not leave us to reap the consequences of our own sinfulness. But the Bible tells us that before the foundation of the world, Lord, you had already offered yourself as a sacrifice for our sins. And Lord, it's because of your sacrifice that we can be here today to worship you. And Lord, it's because of your sacrifice that we can assemble here today free from the condemnation that our deeds should warrant. But we can, we can be here in the newness of life that you have given us freely in your blood. Oh Lord, we are so, so thankful. So thankful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you have done for us. And Lord, it's in faith that we lay hold of the promises. But Lord, we pray for mercy because even though you gave your life that we could live free from sin, so many of our lives are still sadly steeped in it. Heavenly Father, have mercy. Have mercy. Keep us, Lord, from presumptuous sins. Yeah. Help us to experience the power, the power that is in the blood of Christ. The power not only to save from the consequence of sin, Lord, but also the power to redeem from the reality of sin in our existence. Help us where we are weak, dear Lord. Give us strength. Give us wisdom. Give us pure hearts. Give us holy desires. Help us to desire to serve you from our inward parts. And the Lord, when we have decided to make a stand for you, give us the strength to walk, to walk, despite how the enemy may jostle us and prod us and attack us. May we rest on the promises, Heavenly Father. But I pray for 
every person under the hearing of my voice and the families that they represent. Lord, I lift them up before you, asking that your, your richest blessings will be felt in their life. Lord, you know the things that come to test us in this world. But Father, I just pray that in all the things that we go through, there will be nothing that would tear our grip away from you, Lord. And if our fingers should slip, I just pray that you would never lose hold of us. So Father, we place our burdens in your care because we know that you are able and willing to see to all of our each and every need that we have. And so, Lord, as our needs are removed, I pray that in their place, we would, rather than focusing on our needs and our wants, may our only focus be, what can I do to please my Lord? How can I live to please my God? Because I know that my bills, my income, my family's problems, my health, it's safe in your hands. Help us, Lord, just to focus on doing your will. By your grace, it can be so. Lord, I pray for the speaker today. Lord, I pray that you first would speak to him. And Lord, as you speak to him, may he speak to us in the, in the power and in the spirit of what he has heard you say to him. And Lord, may your Holy Spirit rest on us as it rests upon him. May you bring about your will in your church may you perform your will to your people and lord as we understand that our our reality our assurance our future is safe in your hands then lord we can in hope and in in faith we wait for the appearance of the promise lord thank you for the thing that you have done for us Thank you for the things that you are doing and working out, even now behind the scenes, Heavenly Father. And Lord, we look forward to the day where you will break the clouds of glory and you will come finally to take us home from this world of sin. Lord, we look forward to breaking bread with you. Jesus, we look forward to drinking the fruit of the vine new with you. What a wonderful, wonderful day that will be. Father, keep us faithful until the day. We pray earnestly in the name of Jesus. Amen. Very happy Sabbath, church. Um, it's a very special Sabbath because of our communion. And I just, uh, in brief, um, show you how we go from here up to the finish of our service. So after I speak, we will be inviting you to sing, of course, with your mics muted, the hymn Blessed Assurance, whilst we show you a small clip of a simple um, foot washing. And after the foot washing, we enter straight into the communion table uh, for the bread and the wine. So please make ready of your bread and wine there because after the, this song uh, blessed assurance we go in there and after we have uh, partaken partake um, partook the bread and wine we go straight into a special item and then the sermon <laughs> i 
for the bread is taken from Luke chapter 22 verse 19 and he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me loving kind father and heaven thank you so much for what it did for us and Calvary Thank you for seeing us and knowing what our needs are. And we ask that as we partake of this bread which represents your body, that each one of us will be able to understand and be drawn to you. We pray that you will help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as half as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Loving Father, thank you for this opportunity you've given to us one more time, that we can now participate in this part of the service where we are drinking the wine which represents your blood. We ask, Father, that as we drink it, that it will purify us. It will help us to understand what you did for us. And we ask that we too will be drawn closer to you in our daily living. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. now going to partake this bread as a symbol of Christ's body broken for our redemption followed by a silent prayer
Now this is the unfermented wine, the symbol of the blood of Christ Jesus that is poured for the ransom of many and that includes you and me. Let's drink it, followed by a silent prayer.
Committing your family to God. It has been impressed in the hearts of our local leaders as well as in mine that if there is anything that is worth preaching these days, it's about our families. It's our homes. We ought to bring Jesus into our homes even before we can bring others to Jesus. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And let me tell you this, that getting ready for the coming of Jesus is something we need to do at home. And that sounds very simple, but that is deep. It means that we've got to be Christians at home. Now, have you noticed that it's so hard to be Christians at home? It is because we think nobody's watching us. Yes, nobody except your angels and our God. Do you realize that in the eyes of heaven, if we cannot be Christians at home, we're no Christians in no place. At home, we spread the rumors over the phone and stab somebody at the back. At home, we fight and we quarrel and we say what we want to say to our loved ones. At home, we watch anything that we like, how long we like. We do anything we want at home because it's our home. If we can't be Christians at home, we cannot be Christians anywhere. We can only pretend to be, but God cannot be fooled. All of us have got to realize that the hardest place to be Christ-like is at home. I'm a bit hesitant to preach on the topic of family because, first of all, I'm afraid I might sound as if I am an expert on the subject. I'm not. True, I have performed a number of wedding ceremonies preached wedding sermons and counseled couples. I also have the experience of 17 years of marriage and counting, but many of you have been married for longer than I am. And then there is this inescapable fact that I am not perfect. My wife is a testimony to that. We also face a share of marital struggles and adjustments along the way. The fact is my wife and I, along with our child, and all families are in the process together because the journey of marriage and family life goes on and on. And so this sermon is for you and for me today. And I would just bring three main points with a few sub points in between. The first one, the home should be a place of prayer. You say, <laughs> I knew that already. That's obvious. That's not even profound. Everybody knows that. Let me say this. We may know that, yes, but the problem is so many Christian homes, they're not even places of prayer. We know they should be places of prayer, but they're not places of prayer at all. We do a lot of stuff at home for long, long hours until late at night, until early hours in the morning. We endure sleepless nights in our homes, doing things that actually have nothing to do with our spiritual growth, nothing to do in preparing us for heaven. And we love it. Yes, we know. But until now, this isn't happening or this is scarcely happening. So now, it's time to renew this reminder to all of us that we do this not merely a ceremony, but as a genuine way of life. The home should be a place of prayer, and it does in three environments. First, personal devotion. This is different from family devotion or family worship or corporate worship at church. This is for you as an individual. It means giving your heart personally to Jesus every day alone in your prayer. Each one should develop a personal 
intimate relationship with Christ because salvation is an individual matter. I know you know that there is a vast difference between knowing someone and simply knowing about someone. You can read about Martin Luther or Florence Nightingale. You can know about their history. You can memorize their sayings and admire their lives. But you cannot have a personal relationship with them. You cannot know them. You can only know about them. And that is the reason why the psalmist says to us, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You see, many Christians have been content to know about God. They love arguments using the Bible text. They can talk about the doctrines all day. They can argue until they get blue in their faces. However, when you ask them to share about what the Lord has done for them and to them personally, they have nothing to share. They have knowledge about God, but they don't know Him personally. And that is why your personal devotion, your personal time with Jesus, your personal evaluation, your personal reflection of your walk with Him will give you a fresh perspective where you are in your standing before God, in your dealings with your family members, and what type of influence you have as a Christian witness to the people around you. To talk of religion in a casual way, to pray without soul hunger and living faith, avails nothing. It is not enough to believe about Christ. We must believe in Him. We need to come to know Him in a personal one-to-one -one communion. If men will give their hearts to Jesus every morning, it makes a lot of difference. And women, that is for you too. If you do that, you will be nicer. You see, the Bible talks about the nagging woman. She drives you out of your mind. The Bible talks about that in the book of Proverbs. Ladies, if you give your heart to Jesus in the morning, then during the day, when you're tempted to go, ha ha, you'll think twice. And someone says, I don't know why it is that a woman can say to you when you have your shirts and tie and your jacket put on, she sees you and she will just say to you, ah, ha, 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 don't wear that tie. They don't go together. Go back and change that tie. Say that to you and you just say, yes, ma'am. But if you say to her, honey, don't wear that blouse. That makes you look uh, big. You don't want to do that. You don't do that. The whole week can be ruined by that just one little comment. You know where we get into trouble in our relationships? You know where we are fighting? We are fighting down here on stuff that makes no difference whatsoever. Many are throwing away their marriages. They are fighting on stuff that make no difference. What I discovered in order to keep marriage in our home is to keep my big mouth shut. I'm telling you the truth because it takes two to tango. It takes two to make a quarrel. And the one in the wrong usually does most of the talking. And this is what I always say to the couples. If one is on fire, then be a water. Even if it's a hot water, it will kill the fire. You are angry as well. You're hot, but keep your mouth shut. Or if you cannot shut, force yourself to speak gently. Force yourself to speak gentle words. A preacher once said, suppose my spouse will say to me in our argument, I've had enough of you. Ten years of wasted life. I can't stand the look anymore. Supposing my wife did that. Now listen, nothing has happened until I respond. And if she says that awful thing and I don't say anything, what will happen? Well, nothing happens. Soon when she takes a shower and she sees the fresh flower I put on the table, it's gone. You see, it's our response that legitimizes what somebody says. Probably she's just having a hard time at work. And if somebody says something that is bad, or for sure will lead into a fight, what's the solution? Well, don't say anything. Get smart. Keep your big mouth shut. Relationships are falling into pieces 
for no reason, for no good reason. But one thing is certain. You are cooler, you are nicer, you are wiser when you have knelt and you have your own personal time with God. Because the starting point to overcome temptations is not at the time of temptation, but before that, the giving of yourself at the beginning of the day is the necessary preparation for anything that may be thrown at you during the course of the day. And another time when we need to pray at home is during family devotion. Family worship doesn't have to be a sermon time. There are a lot of things that we can do in our worship that everybody can participate. It doesn't have to last for an hour, but it's something, something that even little children can do. One family had their family devotion. The pastor was there and the family made a little circle. The pastor was in the center. And then the father said, our family devotion today is about saying the nice things about the person next to you. Saying the nice things about your family members? Wow! But isn't that something that we should do often? Appreciating genuinely each other? Family worship should be planned, just like when we do anything else, because of all the things that we do, family worship is top most of important. It doesn't matter if your worship is just like a baby stuff. Make it a family thing. Make it short and sweet. By the way, with a young family, when you pray with your kids, don't be just one-sided. When you pray about asking the Lord to forgive them about their specific mistakes, you have to confess yours too, at least. Even if it is just in general terms, when they are with you. Because it's easy to be praying and confessing about your child's mistake. But what about yours? If you want to confess your children's errors to God, confess yours as well. Make it balanced. How can your children learn how to repent if they're not seeing repentance in us? When we cannot even muster to say sorry to them when we overdo what we do to them. So we have private devotion, we have family worship or devotion, and another thing, and this is for married couples. Please, pray with your spouse. The reason why I say this is because many Christian husbands or Christian wives are praying with anybody in the church and everybody with anything and everything except for one person. Guess who? Their spouse. Men, I don't mean to be harsh on you in this area, but this is the area where you should be leading. Many of us are subcontracting spiritual matters in our homes. We leave it to the ladies. We make a big mistake in doing that. Men are created by God to be spiritual leaders in their homes. Husbands, step up, step forward, and be intentional in having a right relationship with your maker and with your wife. Pray together as husbands and wives and lead it. It's not sexy, it's not romantic, but it's bonding, it's spiritual. And you pray out loud, just the two of you. You will hear each other's sigh that you've never heard before. You know, this was suggested to a couple. The couple did just the same. And that lady returned one day and said, Pastor, last night my husband and I prayed for the very first time together. You should have heard what he said in that prayer. I have so much respect for him now. There you go. I cannot think of a good man here today who doesn't crave for the respect of his woman. So married couples, you know what to do at home tonight. You say, shall we? Shall we do it? Shall we do what? Shall we do what the pastor suggested? Okay, you might get a little embarrassed at first, but please do it. Give it a try if you haven't done it yet. Make it a part of your married life. It's hard to be praying together for each other genuinely and think of divorce at the same time. It's hard to do that. You can try, but it won't work. The family that prays together stays together. You understand the meaning of it now. The second point is something, something very sensitive. This is the time that I would you know, expect to run out of the building if we were in the church today. It's a good thing that I am away from you. The second point is, it has something to do with TV and the internet. 
you need to do something about your TV and internet habits. The TV, as watched by the average Christian, is incompatible by the spirit-filled life. If we keep watching TV the way most people are, we will lose our salvation. Because by watching the stuff we are watching on TV or in the internet, we are celebrating the very thing without which Jesus died. You know very well that by beholding, we become changed. Now, did I say you couldn't watch TV? No. Did I say you can't do internet? No. Do something about TV. Do something about your internet. Spiritism, and magic, the dead walks and speaks and other stuff. And then they show you plain adultery in front of your eyes. If the movie scenarios of adultery today in your living room were shown 30 years ago, the Christian person would react differently. Now we watch them and as if nothing alarms us. We don't even react. Why is that? Well, it's simple. It's the constant and the gradual conditioning of the mind because by beholding, we become changed. And what are these things going to do in our heads? They're burning our conscience out. That's what they do. The amount of media entertainment in our brains could easily wipe out the voice and the influence of the Holy Spirit. They make us very timid and reluctant to share Jesus. Please, choose what you watch. Be a critique of what you watch. Be vigilant what you are seeing. And have that spiritual alertness to distinguish what is right and what is wrong. Grab a spiritual book that lifts up Jesus and His Word alongside that Word of God for you to compare. Now, these are rhetorical questions. How many of us read the Bible one hour a day? How many of us read good spiritual books? If we are honest enough, we spend more time browsing the internet or watching TV more than meditating the pages of the Word of God. I want us to be aware again that we need to feed our soul ourselves. We cannot just rely on the preacher once a week. We've got to feed our own soul as much as we feed our body with food. Because heaven is a path of choice, and that choice is every day of our lives. We've got to live for God every day. I'm not saying that we go to heaven by our works and our efforts. Salvation is free. It is a gift. But all I'm saying is, God is not just interested in pardoning us, but He's also in the business of transforming us from within and without. Transformation through the development of our inner self, our inner character, into the likeness of His Son. You see, many Christians say, if the time came, I would die for God. I say, but why? Why would do you like to die for God? You see, the theme that dominates in their minds is all about persecution. Persecution, and you are living in the UK. You are living in a democratic country. That might not even happen in your lifetime. You see, God is not interested in people who will die for Him. He is interested rather in people who will live for Him. They would say, I would die for God, but do not even think of giving up their addictions, certain behaviors, and unwholesome activities. And God looks down on us and say, what? You want to die for me? You don't even want to live for me. You don't want to even live a lifestyle for me. What are you doing with your private gadgets in the privacy of your room? What do you do with it? What are you looking? Have you guarded your thoughts and motives? Have you for a second realized that gradually you can become a prisoner of your own device? Many people think they can be heroes for God at the end of time, but they cannot even be heroes for God today. Many think, they can just lay down their lives at the end of time, but they don't even think how to become victorious over their bad habits today. What we do, what we choose now, determines our eternal destiny. The little choices that we do are actually priming us to make the most important decision one day. Don't worry about being ready to die for God. Worry about being available to live for Him today. You've been justified, yes, but you've got to be sanctified too. And sanctification is a lifetime process. So we have got to grow. 
we've got to improve. And we don't do that only in church. We do that in our private lives and in the privacy and the confines of our own homes. And the next important point is an advice from the Bible, the text we read earlier. Please be kind enough to forgive and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Now, please listen very carefully because this is perhaps the most important of all human relationships. Kindness, tender-hearted, forgiving. Because God is. And He has done it. He has been doing it. He's still doing it. And will be doing it to us all the time. He is not asking us to do this. If He Himself has not done that already to us. You know, here is a young man helping an elderly lady cross the street. He doesn't know this woman, but he says she needs help. And so he helps. What would our homes be like if we are as kind to each other as to a total stranger? Why would we talk with nobody's outside so nice, so professional, so articulate, so respectful? But at home, we are so different. You see, at the end of the day, all you have is your family. No one is dying and says, I wish I had more time in the office. Or, I wish I made more money. When it comes to the key things, when it boils down to the honest realization of what is important, it goes down to the family. It's all about your family. One time a pastor friend shared his experience. His phone rang on a Saturday morning. And when he said hello, there was nobody to answer. And what happened was that the owner of that phone while driving his car to the church that morning accidentally dialed the number. And perhaps it was a speed dial or something. And while they were shuffling around in that car, it made a call unbeknownst to them. The pastor said, you couldn't believe what was going on in that car. They were howling, they were screaming at each other, and the words that were used were just terrible. It was horrendous for a Sabbath morning. Now, I'm not telling you anything about any details, but you know what? It's so easy for us to do that, isn't it? We say, shut up, don't talk to me like that. And then when we get to the car parking, we say, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. There's something wrong with that. Home should be made all that the word implies. It should be a little heaven upon earth, a place where the affections are cultivated instead of being studiously repressed. Practice forgiveness. In this present world where we live now, you know, goodness is rewarded, of course, and badness is punished because human beings have a deep need for justice. In this world, we say, I have my rights. I demand justice, debit for credit, measure for measure, reward for hard work, punishment for sin, tit for tat. When somebody has wronged us, we want payback. In this world, we rejoice when justice is meted out. But remember, to forgive is to set the prisoner free and to discover that the prisoner was you. And with all honesty, Forgiveness is not there. It's unfair. Why? Because we have to forego the punishment that others deserve. Question is, was it fair for Jesus to die? No, it was not. But was it necessary for him to undergo those unfairness for us to be forgiven? Yes. And that is the bottom line as to why we are asked and commanded to forgive. Because Jesus has done that to us, and we are the recipient of that extravagant grace and forgiveness. Now He is asking us to do just the same. But we are different. We want to prove that we are correct and that we want everyone to know that the other side is dead wrong. And we make so loud a noise to the extent that the whole world eventually discovers the three sides of truth. Your side, their side on the right side. Only after all the carnage, after all the dust have settled, that you realize you have only remained on your side, never stepped on their side, and most of all, you have never arrived at the right side. 
there is a Spanish story of a father and son whose relationship was in bad terms. The son ran away, and the father set off to find him, and he searched for months to no avail. Finally, in a last desperate effort to find him, the father put an ad in the Madrid newspaper. And this is the message in that newspaper. Dear Paco, meet me in front of this newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. And you know what? On that Saturday, 800 sons, all named Paco, showed up. 800 of them seeking for the forgiveness of their father. If we could understand our own weakness and see the sharp traits in our character which need repressing, we should see so much to do for ourselves that we would humble our hearts under the mighty hand of God. This is the problem. We don't see much of ourselves. We only see others because we have been comparing ourselves with the wrong standard. Had we compared ourselves with the righteousness of Christ, we would have seen so clearly our own defects, and we would be more tolerant to see others' shortcomings and realize instantly that what we see in them is simply a reflection of our own selves. Committing our families to God means the home should be a place of prayer in our personal devotion, family devotion, and in spouses praying together. We commit to Him by saturating our lives with whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, lovely, and admirable. And members of the family, remember, you have been forgiven. The Lord has made a commitment in the cross to forgive you. Do yourself a favor. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And when we do that, He will bless us in all dimensions, immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. God bless you. Amen. 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 I hope, <clears throat> I hope and pray that the message has found its place in our hearts and in our minds. I have to take this opportunity to thank the deacons and deaconesses, the elders. Thank you so much, even the communications department, in which I am now looking at their signal if it is now time for me to pray. Um, and there is a 30 second delay actually between the live stream and this one. So when the signal is on, I'll pray now. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're sorry if we have fallen short to your standard, and actually we have in so many ways, in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. And we would like to thank for Jesus. Thank you, thank you so much, Jesus, who initiated to us the new covenant so that we can be renewed. Thank you, Lord, for our family. We thank you so much for entrusting to us our children. Thank you, Lord, for making us one with our spouses. We ask, Lord, that our families will be a blessing to us and to others around us. We pray, Father, that when you shall come, when you ask to us, where is the flock? I have entrusted to your care. We can present them to you, O oh Lord, not because of our strength, but because of the strength of Jesus that helps us through. Thank you, Lord, that you will build, help Bilston Church, the church family, and every individual family, that we all will be ought to be the family 
the family that really lifts up Christ Jesus and bring honor and glory to him. Thank you, Lord, that you hear this prayer and for accepting our worship today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Yeah.